Hi, my name is Julia Goldschmidt, and I would like to warmly welcome you to a staged reading of my new play, To Be Well. This play is my senior thesis that I'm completing through the Department of Film, Television, and Theater at the University of Notre Dame, advised by Professor Anne Garcia Romero. To Be Well is a modern play inspired by the writings of the medieval female Christian mystic Julian of Norwich. The play centers around Liz, a high school student whose spiritual life is greatly impacted by both the mystical writings of Julian and her own intense mental health struggles. As Liz begins to have trouble distinguishing whether her spiritual experiences are a result of mystical revelation or of her mental illness, Liz and her writings, excuse me, Julian and her writings impact the bodies, minds, and souls of all those around Liz. Now I would like to take a moment to thank some people who have made this play and this reading possible. First, I would like to thank my actors for sharing their talents. Callista Kinnan, Lisa Von Werder, Vanessa Fitzpatrick, Jacqueline Janowski, Reese Bailey, George Copeland, and Lindsay Goldschmidt. The rehearsal period for this reading was incredibly short and I thank them for dedicating their time to this project. Next, I would like to thank my wonderful director and friend, Isabel Grogan. She has really brought the words to life and I could not be more grateful. I would like to also thank my faculty advisor and mentor, Anne Garcia Romero, for her feedback and support through every step of the writing process. Finally, I would like to thank Platform Production Company. This play was developed originally through Platform Projects Writers Edition Writers Workshop in the fall of 2020, and now has come full circle to being presented in full through Platform. So thank you everyone at Platform for all of your assistance. And now I am so excited to present to you a staged reading of my play, To Be Well. To Be Well by Julia Goldschmidt. For we are so preciously loved by God that we cannot even comprehend it. Julian of Norwich. Characters, Liz Price, 17, a senior in high school, thoughtful, spiritual, finds herself at odds with a superficial empirical world, recently diagnosed with schizophrenia. Veronica Younger, 17, Liz's best friend of many years, funny, sarcastic, superficial. Amanda Price, 40s, Liz's mom, loves Liz more than anything. Julian of Norwich, late 30s, early 40s, medieval anchoress, Christian mystic. There is something ethereal about the way she moves and speaks, dressed conservatively and simply with clothes that are a nod to the period. Connor Farrell, 18, Veronica's newest boyfriend. Priest, 70s, Liz's confessor, blind. Several voices played by the same actors as Veronica, Amanda, Connor, and Priest. Setting, 2019, Radnor, PA. Lights rise on Liz in an empty space. The lights are surreal and cool. Liz is unsettled. She looks around and watches as Julian enters the space. Upon Julian's entrance, unintelligible whispering fills the space, starting quiet, then growing in volume as Julian crosses to center stage. The two women look at each other for a moment and the voices fade. Julian's voice is ethereal and sounds far away. Are you sick? I was. Pause. Whispers come in and out. Do you have? Julian furrows her eyebrows. Does it matter? Can you make me well? I can. How? Showings. A long pause as the whispers crescendo and fade out several times. Do not be afraid. All shall be well. Julian exits and the voices stop when she leaves. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz and Veronica lounging in Liz's bedroom. What would you do if tomorrow was your last day on earth? Huh. That's kind of a loaded question, don't you think? I don't mean anything by it. I'm honestly curious. Why is it my last day on earth? Am I terminal or something? <laughs> oh my gosh, it doesn't matter. Sure, if it helps you picture it, you're terminal. Okay, now that I can picture the scene a little more clearly. Yeah, I have no idea what I would do. I guess I'd spend some time with my mom. Maybe go into Philly and see a show. 
I feel like you're supposed to say something about family. You're not supposed to say anything. I want to know the real answer. Veronica seriously thinks for a moment. You remember when we were kids and we'd sneak out of a sewing class our moms made us go to? The one at the library? Yeah, that one. When we made a little clothes for American Girl dolls, we'd go up behind the library where that big hill was. And in the summer, there were all these little white flowers. We'd spend the whole day out there. We really thought we were getting away with something, but the instructors totally knew where we were the whole time. We'd pretend we were fairies and we'd make crowns out of the flowers. I forgot about that. It was like our own little world. Yeah. I think that's what I would do if I had one day to live. You'd pretend you were a fairy? No. Well, maybe. I'd, I'd spend the whole day out there on that hill, lay in the grass, pick the flowers, play berries, watch the sunset. That does sound like a wonderful last day. They both sit thinking for a moment. And how would you spend your last day alive? That's hard. You don't say. Don't laugh. Liz, come on. It's me. We tell each other everything. Well, I want to believe I would spend every minute with you. Wow. Liz, thank you. She gives Liz a warm hug. They sit next to each other and Veronica keeps her arm around Liz. I know you like all that sappy stuff, but what made you think of this? I don't know. I guess senior year is when people have existential crises. I really want to go to a good school, like Vanderbilt or Georgetown, but it feels like such a long shot. And it's only August and Casey Walters already knows where she's going. Yes, that is crazy, but she was being recruited for field hockey. There were tons of schools fighting over her. That sounds nice. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'll be begging any school to take me. Oh, come on, Liz. You have amazing grades. Me, on the other hand, you're going to get into an awesome school. Uh, well, I'm not even sure college is for me. What are you even talking about? Everyone goes to college. Veronica ignores the question and looks at her phone. I hate to do this, but I should really head home. My mom will kill me if I miss dinner again. She stands to collect her things and put them in her bag. And why have you been missing dinner? because I've been hanging out with Connor like every night this week. She puts her bag over her shoulder. Thought so. And I've only gotten to see my therapist this week. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Absolutely. The two girls hug again and Veronica exits as a silver necklace with a medal drops out of her backpack and onto Liz's floor. Neither girl seems to notice. Once Veronica has gone, the lights shift and Liz opens her journal, writing for a moment before she speaks aloud. Julian is sitting at a desk on another part of the stage. Sparse furniture and lighting suggest she is in her anchorite cell. She is writing like Liz. They are clearly not in the same space, but their spaces mirror each other's. The two women consider each other, then speak. The following is a conversation between the two women, each bound by the words they are able to put on paper. When I was crying all the time my sophomore year of high school, I started seeing this therapist. This is a revelation of love that Jesus Christ, our endless bliss, made in 16 showings or particular revelations. I was sick, but I didn't want to die. I was in a really bad place. Like, I would come home every day from school and just sob for an hour straight. Because if I lived, I should have been able to love God better and for longer, so that I should know God better and love him more in the joy of heaven. I had way too much schoolwork, my friends were just awful, and I wasn't sleeping. I was so miserable and I felt like there was no escape. The priest held the cross before me as I lay dying and said, I have brought you the likeness of your maker and savior. Look upon it and draw comfort from it. My mom begged me to stop crying to feel anything besides sad. Angry, frightened, disgusted, just not sad. But I couldn't do anything about the way I felt. So when my mom got really scared I'd never be happy again, she suggested I see a therapist, which I was open to. A lot of people are surprised I didn't put up a fight, but why would I? 
I felt awful and whatever I was trying to do clearly wasn't working. So I thought I might as well see what someone else has to say about it. Suddenly I saw the red blood trickle down from under the crown of thorns, hot and fresh and flooding out as it did at the time of his passion. When the crown of thorns was pressed into his blessed head, he who was both God and man and who suffered for me, I saw this. And I was diagnosed, eventually. I wasn't really told outright. Like, I remember one day after I had talked to my therapist for a while, my therapist said, so it sounds like your depression is getting worse. And I was kind of shocked because I had never heard that word used to describe me before. So I was like, I guess this means I have depression. Same with anxiety. I knew I was an anxious person and I had a lot of symptoms of anxiety, but I never thought I had anxiety. And I was astounded at the wonder of it, that he who is so high and holy will be so homely with a sinful soul living in frail flesh. I saw this in my illness. And as if senior year of high school isn't stressful enough, I had a pretty weird therapy session yesterday. My therapist used a new word. I'm not really sure what it even means yet. I started Googling around, which I know you're not supposed to do, but it's confusing. All I know is that I should not have told my therapist I was having trouble telling what was real and what was something else. He brought our blessed lady to my mind. A simple, humble girl, not much more than a child. By this, I know surely that she is higher in worth and grace than anyone that God has made. I knew this because of my illness. Julian exits. Liz seems confused, but finishes her story. Apparently, my brain doesn't do a good job distinguishing between what is important and what information I don't need to hold on to. So I hold on to everything and give everything a ton of meaning. And that's enough to get to anybody after a while. Delusions aren't uncommon. Hallucinations can happen. And that causes people to withdraw from others. And wow, learning that really freaked me out. I'm on medication for it, but it doesn't seem like enough. Like the meds will help me. I know that and I trust my doctors, but there is more wrong with me. Something with my heart maybe or my soul, so I need help. I'm not sure what that help is going to look like. I need someone or something because I don't think schizophrenia just goes away. Liz lays down on her bed looking at her phone. Liz begins to hear whispered voices. They start off very quiet and with several seconds of silence between whispers. They're largely unintelligible. Eventually they become louder and more frequent. Liz is annoyed by the whispers and keeps looking up from her phone to see if she can determine where they are coming from. Who's there? Wisdom. Ignorance. Prayer. Love. Precious. Well. Liz is scared and frustrated as the voices get louder and rise to a climax. She slams down her phone on the bed. Shut up! Immediately, all of the voices stop and silence fills the space. Liz looks around skeptically and then goes back to her phone. Just as she's getting comfortable, her door opens and Julian walks into the room silently. She walks over to where Veronica has dropped the necklace and picks it up without Liz noticing. When Liz looks up from her phone, she's clearly startled to see someone standing in her room. Oh my gosh. Can I help you? Actually... I came to help you. Good luck with that. Julian doesn't say anything. She just stands there like a specter. Hello? Julian floats around Liz's room, taking it in, becoming familiar with its four walls. Whispering rises during this time. Liz is confused, but mesmerized by Julian's fluid movements. This might as well happen to me. Well, if you don't have anything to say, I have a lot of Anna Karenina to read for AP Lit tomorrow, so... Julian turns and walks towards Liz. The two face each other and consider each other. The two are distinct, but share some indescribable quality. 
Julian reaches into her pocket and keeps something small in her hand. What's that? Julian opens her hand, palm up, to reveal a hazelnut. Liz is visibly confused. Julian closes her hand and puts the hazelnut into her pocket. I must go now. Julian floats out of the room and vanishes as mysteriously as she appeared. The whispering grows very loud. Liz is freaked out with wide eyes. She looks around the room and it feels different, but looks the same. She grabs a blanket, wraps herself in it, and crawls onto her bed, curled up. Lights shift. It is the next morning. Liz wakes up disoriented. She rolls over, checks her phone, and lays back down for a moment. When she sits up, she notices Julian is in her room. Liz jumps. Oh my gosh! What the heck? Good morning, Elizabeth Price. No. No and no. I can't. No. I won't. I can't deal with this right now. You need to leave. And how do you know my name? I... Nope. Never mind. I don't care. You have to go. And never come back. You're not real. Elizabeth, I'm here to help. I don't need your help. It would actually help me a lot if you left because I've already freaked everyone out enough by telling them that I'm hearing things. I don't need to be seeing things too. I don't know why you think you'd be able to help me. Many stronger than you have tried. Tried to what? To fix me, to cure me, to make me well. Oh, Elizabeth, my child, I didn't say I came to fix you. That would be silly considering there is nothing wrong with you. I was just diagnosed with freaking schizophrenia. There's obviously a lot wrong with me. Julian shakes her head at Liz sadly. And I refuse to play into whatever you think you are. You're not real. You're not real. Go. Get out of here. Julian leaves without another word. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz watching TV on her laptop in her room. There's a soft knock on the door. Yeah? May I come in? Liz pauses her show. Yeah, Mom. I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing. Oh, thanks. I'm pretty good, I think. No, um, sounds? They're called auditory hallucinations. They said it's important to use proper terminology when talking about this. When talking about schizophrenia, it makes it less scary. Of course. Sorry, sweetie. Have you had any auditory hallucinations? Just the whispers. It hasn't been too bad. It's not distracting me or anything. That's good to hear. You'll tell me if it gets worse or anything changes, right? Like if the voices get louder or if- Or if I start seeing things. (laughs) Mom looks quickly at Liz, confused and concerned. Right. You haven't though, right? Nope. But that is a symptom of schizophrenia. A very serious symptom. That would mean that you probably needed an adjustment to your medication. But no need to worry about that right now. How are the meds, by the way? The olazapine? Well, this is turning into quite the interview. I'm definitely feeling a little weaker than before, and I'm kind of achy. I haven't noticed a whole lot else going on. But the psychiatrist did say that it could take up to six weeks for the medication to take full effect. That's true. I'm glad you seem to be doing well. You're such a trooper, especially since we lost your father. It's okay, Mom. You don't have to. It's okay. Since it's just you and me, I just want you to know I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you through this. 100%. We're going to get you back to normal. Mom puts her arm around Liz in a comforting hug. Normal? What's that? Good point. (laughs) Want to help me with dinner? I'm making lasagna. As long as you don't try to brainstorm college essay topics for me while we work. Funny you should mention that. (laughs) I actually had a really good idea for a personal statement. You could talk about that time you volunteered at your grandmother's nursing home. Nope. (laughs) I am not writing about that. There has to be something more interesting I can write about. As Amanda starts to leave the room with Liz, she accidentally knocks a book off of Liz's desk onto the floor and looks at it as she picks it up. Julian of Norwich. Never heard of him. 
Yeah, that's just the book I have to read for my theology class, Revelations of Divine Love or something like that. The two leave Liz's room to go to the kitchen. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz in her room. There are books scattered around. She's apparently reorganizing a bookshelf. She gets distracted and starts flipping through a paperback. As she opens the book, the whispering starts and slowly grows as Julian enters the room. Hello, Elizabeth. I'm ignoring you until you go away. You are a smart and holy girl. I think you know I am not going anywhere. Liz turns away. Silent treatment. Julian bends down and picks up a book from the ground. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Is this a recent release? Are you serious? That book is super old. Must have been after my time then. What are you talking about? You sound... Never mind. I shouldn't care. Why not? Because you are not real. I don't know who you are. I don't know anything about you. And it's going to stay that way. I'm not going to let myself buy into visual hallucinations. My mom already thinks I've lost it. What does your mom think you lost? My mind? I'm pretty sure she thinks I'm losing my mind. She treats me like I'm made of glass. But I'm not sure why I'm telling you all this. I don't even know your name. Why are you here? My name is Julian, and I am here because I had a feeling you needed help. You said it yourself. You need help. And God heard your prayer for help. It was a good and holy prayer which pleased God. It's clear that your mom and therapist and everyone else who is supposed to be helping you isn't actually helping at all. What do you mean? They are trying to make you well, correct? I guess. Of course they are. They care about you deeply and they see something wrong with you. You are depressed, you are anxious, you are hallucinating, you are, what's the word they like to use? Schizophrenic. That is the one. They see that as a problem to be solved. But tell me this, Elizabeth, did any one of your doctors or your mom at any point ask you if you wanted to be well? No, I guess they didn't. But of course I want to get better. Why wouldn't I want to be well? What do you think it means to be well? Um, I think it means that I could be happy and not worried and that I wouldn't have the... Liz pauses and Julian raises her eyebrows, telling her to go on. The hallucinations anymore? What do you mean by hallucinations? That's when I can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. Like, I see or hear things that aren't there. Like you. <laughs> well then, I guess that means that I have had hallucinations as well. <laughs> Why do you seem so happy about that? Because it is a wonderful thing to see things. Truly a gift from God. I call them showings. Most days, I still cannot believe he let me, his humble servant, receive such beautiful showings. Showings? Is that even a word? I have much to teach you. Would you like to learn? Uh, yes, I would. <laughs> Wonderful. I will be back soon. But for now, I want you to have this. Julian pulls out the necklace she picked up earlier and puts it around Liz's neck. Liz looks at it after it is on. Is this you? Julian does not reply. Instead, she stands and walks silently to the door. Just before she leaves. Remember, Elizabeth, all shall be well. Liz sits on the bed, stunned. Lights shift. Lights rise in a liminal space with a Freudian therapy couch. Liz enters and lays on her back on the couch, hands folded. Very cliche. I like to think I'm a religious person. I know God is real, and sometimes he sends apparitions of Mary and stuff to the saints. But not to me. Why would he send one to me? Why would he send me Julian? I'd say that I'm a practicing Catholic. I pray before I go to bed, and I feel like I can have a conversation with God, but that doesn't make me holy. 
I'm just me. How can someone who is holy question who God even is? Because I have a lot of questions. I feel like it's hard to know God. He's all the way up there and <laughs> I'm all the way down here. And I can't be holy because there's some stuff about the church that's hard for me to understand. But I do believe in God and I would describe myself as Catholic. That must count for something. Julian enters and sees Liz on the couch. What are you doing? Liz sits up. Therapy. What is therapy? Talk therapy? You sit on a couch with a psychologist and you talk through the stuff that's on your mind? Like this. I've noticed a lot of my friends who are Catholic have been kind of falling away from their faith. They don't go to mass very much anymore. Some of them are having sex with their boyfriends. It's hard for me to talk about faith with them. Sometimes they roll their eyes when I say that I can't go to something or I have to leave early because I have to go to mass, but I like it. Maybe it's weird, but I always feel better after I go to mass or go to confession or pray for a little, especially after my dad died. He always would pray with me before bed. And now I can't sleep until I pray. Some nights I think I'll just skip it because I'm too tired, but I won't be able to fall asleep until I do. So you are praying. No, I'm not praying. Praying is something you do at church or before meals, hands folded. <laughs> you mean like how your hands are folded now? No, I mean, kind of. I don't know. This is just talking to a person. Prayer is talking to God. Then bring these concerns to God. You mean like stop going to therapy? Not necessarily. If this is good for your soul, then by all means, keep doing therapy. But you can also bring these same things to God. Like so. My soul is troubled and so lost, but... I also know that our soul is so specially loved by our Lord that it is highest, that it surpasses the knowing of all creatures. There is no creature that is made that may fully know how much and how sweetly and how tenderly our maker loves us. For as the body is clad in the clothes and the flesh in the skin and the bones in the flesh and the heart in the breast, so are we clothed, body and soul, in the goodness of God and enfolded in it. Yes, and more fully, for all of these wither and waste away. Our soul is so specially loved by him that it is highest, that it surpasses the knowing of all creatures. There is no creature that is made that may fully know how much and how sweetly and how tenderly our maker loves us. Amen. Julian stands. You should pray, Elizabeth. Julian exits. Liz pauses a moment, blesses herself with the sign of the cross, and prays. Lord, I don't know how this thing with Julian will go. Maybe I'll never see her again. Maybe she'll realize I'm not holy enough or whatever to receive visions from God. Or maybe my schizophrenia will give me a hallucination of a flying green monster with googly eyes. Either way, I trust in you and your divine will. Amen. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz sitting at her desk doing homework. Julian enters her room, picks up a book on the floor, and sits down on a chair. Liz doesn't look up from her work. You know, it's polite to knock before entering someone's room. I apologize. Do you want me to knock in the future? Liz sighs and looks up from her work, facing Julian. No, it's all right. I have a feeling you'd just come in anyway. How are you feeling today? Tired. A little behind on my physics homework, so I need to catch up. Nobody tells you when you're diagnosed with depression that you won't feel particularly motivated to do work. Julian blinks at Liz. That was supposed to be a joke. Oh? Yeah, loss of interest and motivation are really common symptoms of depression. Well... Today, I learned something new. During my time on Earth, illnesses of the mind were not something commonly recognized. It was thought that demons caused that sort of turmoil. 
There are definitely still people today who think that. But if what you say is true, I probably suffered from a couple bouts of depression in my life. You did? Most definitely. I lived the vast majority of my days in a cell. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Were you some kind of prisoner? In a sense. I don't know if I want to talk to a convict. (laughs) My child, I was never convicted of a crime. I lived in an anchorite cell. It was my job to... Julian sees Liz's confused and distrustful face. Let me see if I can explain this better. For over 50 years of my life, I was an anchoress. Being an anchoress means that I chose because God called me to completely withdraw from society. I lived in a one-room cell attached to a church in Norwich in England. When I chose to be enclosed in that cell, the bishop performed a special rite for me that was basically a funeral. This symbolized how I died to myself into the world. Once I was enclosed in the cell, I never left again. Over three decades in a cell. I was declared dead and I gave up everything, even my name. I took the name of the church, which was St. Julian. So Julian isn't your real name? It certainly is not the one my parents chose. What was your name before? I would rather not say. I am not that person anymore. So you spent most of your life in one room? I did. And I am far from the only one. Many men and women both chose this life in my time. It was pretty radical, even back then. There were some benefits, though. I would not have learned to write if it were not for my being an anchoress. It was the job of many anchoresses to copy down religious texts. We did not have much else to do in our cells. What did your cell look like? It was very small. About the size of this room, I would say. The walls were made of stone. I memorized those walls. I still remember the shape of each one of those stones their dark gray color, how cold they felt in the winter, how they would soak up water when it rained, the angle the rain would come in through three windows. One window faced the street and allowed light to come into the cell. It was tempting to just watch those go about their lives out in the world. I made up little stories about the lives of the people I would see passing by each day. (laughs) The only escape I had from my cell was within my own mind, but I am rambling. (laughs) I had another window that let others attend to my physical needs, and the third was on the wall attached to the church. It let me see and hear the masses that were said, see the altar, and I received the Eucharist through it. But most importantly, people would come and talk to me through this window. They would ask for spiritual advice, and I would do my best to give them counsel. Of course, I was only able to talk to them for a couple hours each day. What did people talk to you about? Mostly, they would ask me to pray for them. Many people did not think that they could pray for themselves in those days. That was the job for priests and nuns and religious people. I heard many tragic stories. People who have lost spouses and children people angry with God, the poorest, most needy people. I did my best to listen to them and remember them in my prayers. What did you do all day? Prayed, mostly. There is a rule that anchorites follow that requires us to pray the liturgy of the hours several times a day and even in the night. Okay, but what did you do the rest of the time? There's only like five different prayers in the liturgy of the hours. Do you know what they are? Uh, yeah. You have the Office of Readings, Lauds in the Morning, Daytime Prayer, Vespers in the Evening, and Compline at Night. I am impressed you know all that. But in my time, there were actually seven daytime hours of prayer and one at night. I would wake up at two in the morning to pray matins. Okay, but even with all that, you weren't praying constantly. And you only talk to people for a couple hours a day. So what else did you do? I wrote, of course. What did you write? Julian hands Liz the book she picked up when she came in. 
this. Silence for a moment as Liz examines the book and flips through the pages. I've been reading it. Good. You should. I'd like to know what you think when you're done. It should answer some of your questions about me. And it may answer some questions you have about you, too. I don't understand. But you will. Julian leaves Liz's room. Liz watches her go and then turns her attention to the book. We see her open the book to the first page and reads, This is the revelation of love that Jesus Christ, our endless bliss, made in 16 showings or particular revelations. Lights shift. Lights rise on Veronica and Liz in Liz's room. Both girls are reading. Liz is very focused. Veronica looks at her for a few seconds before interrupting her focus. What are you reading? It's called Revelations of Divine Love. Wow, catchy title. Mm-hmm, super catchy. It's actually the first piece of writing we have in English by a woman. Ever. Seriously? Seriously. <laughs> a pause. Liz goes back to reading. Well, are you going to tell me what it's about? I didn't realize you were interested. Oh, please. I know I might not be much of a reader, but I like a good story as much as the next person. I don't know if I'd call this a story. That makes no sense. All writing is a story. Romeo and Juliet, that's a story. War and Peace? Never read it, but the movie made it sound like a story. Even a science textbook is a story. Writers are just trying to tell you a story. So whatever touchy-feely stuff is in that book has to be a story. Hmm. I guess I never thought of it that way. You know who you remind me of? My little sister. When she was a toddler, my mom would read her a picture book before bed. Once my aunt gave her a new picture book and my mom was thrilled, of course, because she was sick of reading the same ones over and over again. But there was one problem. One of the pages of the book was just a picture with no words. Why is that a problem? Those are always my favorite pages of a book. No words. The problem is that my sister would insist that my mom read the page. She would throw a huge fit, screaming, read it, read it. And if my mom tried to make up words that went with the picture, she'd only scream louder and say, it doesn't say that. <laughs> okay, that's kind of hilarious. Hey, you think I sound like that? <laughs> mm-hmm. You're nearly having a tantrum because I won't share my book with you. Fine, I don't want to hear it. Like, I'm going to believe that. This book is just kind of hard to explain. Okay, let's start with the author. Who wrote it? Julian of Norwich. Never heard of him. She's a woman, actually. A girl named Julian? Well, that technically that's not her real name. Probably. Damn, this is complicated. I thought I was asking a straightforward question. Maybe I should just start from the beginning. Please. Liz takes a deep breath. Once upon a time, in medieval times, there was a woman. She lived in England in a town called Norwich. We don't know her name. Ooh, let's make one up. How about Rose? Very pretty. When Rose was a child, she would go to church and she'd kneel and pray. She always prayed for the same thing. She wanted to understand Christ's passion. What's well, not to understand? The guy was nailed to a cross and he died. I'm sure it sucked. I guess she wanted to know more than the fact that it sucked. Rose realized one day that the best way for her to understand the passion more is for her to get as close to death as possible. She began to ask God to make her sick. She asked to be made so sick that she would be convinced she was dying. I can't believe she wanted to get sick. That's messed up. Well, that was just Rose's prayer as a child. Then she did what children do, and she grew up. Huge mistake, Rose. She got married to a wonderful man and even had two children. She was so happy for a few years that she nearly forgot about her prayers. But then, disaster struck. Remember how this is the Middle Ages? Well, the Black Death came to her little town. The disease spread like wildfire, and not a single house was spared, including Rose's. She watched as her two children and her husband died in the home that they all shared. Oh my god. It was awful. Rose had nowhere to go. She lost everything. 
So she went home to her mother. How old was she when all this happened? 30. God, lots of people today aren't even married at 30, much less have had and lost two children and a husband by that point. Liz nods, agreeing. Well, it would seem like Rose can't catch a break because six months after she moved back in with her mother, she got sick. Like, really sick. What did she have? No one was really sure. They didn't have the best doctors back then. I bet they just assumed it was the plague and she was a goner. Well, did she die? Wow, someone's invested now. Oh, just, of course I am. Rose was gravely ill for three days and three nights, and she showed no sign of improvement. On the fourth night, she received the last rites of the church, which is the prayers they say over you before you die, because she wasn't expected to live through the night. Surprisingly, she lived for two more days after that. That's when it starts to get weird. As if it wasn't weird before? Rose was so sick that she was delirious and feverish and could hardly see. A priest came again to her side and put a crucifix right in front of her face so she could draw comfort from knowing Jesus suffered too. That was when she started having her showings. What does that mean? That's what she called visions. Oh, so she was hallucinating. No, she wasn't hallucinating. They're from God. They're different from that. Liz, get real. You said she was so sick she was about to die. She probably had a crazy fever and her brain was being boiled and she had hallucinations. You don't know that and don't use that word. What, crazy? Why can't I call her crazy? That's the only logical explanation. She was being driven crazy by- Stop, okay? Stop saying crazy. God can do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to be logical. And this is my story, so I get to see what happens. She wasn't crazy. God chose her to see these visions. Okay, God. I don't know why you're so pissed right now. Can we just get back to the story? Fine. Sorry. This is just kind of important to me. So Rose got crazy sick, and God showed her disturbing and beautiful images. And she didn't die. So she got better. Damn, I didn't know you could really come back from something like that. It was pretty miraculous. So she's like, I have to tell people about this. I need to write down everything I saw. One problem. What now? Remember how this was a long time ago? Rose never learned how to write. She wasn't wealthy, so she didn't know how. But she was determined. She decided to start a new life as an anchoress. Okay, now you're just making words up. Nope, I swear. This was actually a profession that you could have in medieval times. Anchoresses lived their whole lives in a small room attached to a church that they never left. They were basically dead to the world. And to symbolize this, Rose took the name of the church her room was attached to. The church's name was Julian, I'm assuming. Mm Mm-hmm. St. Julian's Church. So she spent her life in this room. She prayed most of the time, but she also learned how to write. And she wrote about the showing she saw. And that's what I'm reading about in this book. That is a pretty good story. I can see why you're obsessed with it. I'm not obsessed. I just really relate to Julian's writing. You want to read it when I'm done? Mm, I'll pass. You know I'm not as into that Jesus stuff as you or the saints or whatever. Well, Julian actually isn't a saint. Why not? It sounds like she was really holy and stuff. Well, there are a couple reasons. One is that we don't know much of anything about her life. But you just told me all about it. A lot of that was me imagining. (laughs) We don't have anything about her except for what's in this book, and it only tells about her showings. It doesn't say anything about her early life or even her real name. The other bigger reason she isn't a saint is that there aren't any miracles attributed to her. To be a saint, people have to pray to her and miracles have to happen. But you know what? I think there's a huge miracle here. It's a miracle that we have her writing. Writing from so long ago is so hard to find, but the the fact that she's a woman, that's a miracle. Sounds like you have your work cut out for you then. What do you mean? She clearly means a lot to you. You should get her canonized. You can pray to her. I'm sure she loves you and would love to give you a miracle. 
maybe you could pray that she helps you with your schizophrenia. Huh. Not a bad idea. The two girls go back to reading. Lights shift. Lights rise. Liz and Julian stand looking at Veronica, who is not aware that Liz and Julian are there. Tell me about Veronica. She is clearly important to you. While Liz speaks, we see Veronica act like she is when she is alone. Perhaps she's painting her nails or reading something on her phone. Liz and Julian watch. Veronica has been my best friend for, well, I guess for forever. We grew up down the street from each other. I don't know what I'm going to do when we go to college next year and I can't just walk down and see her whenever I want. Other friends have come and gone, but Veronica and I have always been there for each other. Inseparable, really. There's this picture of us on Halloween when we were in preschool. We were both Minnie Mouse for Halloween, and we just had the biggest smile on our faces. Yeah, I love her a whole lot. What a beautiful friendship. But that doesn't mean we haven't had our fights. We're totally different people. I'm quieter, more reserved. She's always been the center of attention. Loud, funny. Everyone loves having her around. Maybe that's why we go together so well. I remember at one of our middle school dances, I got my period and it stained my white skirt. I was so embarrassed and crying and I was about to leave. But Veronica, in her infinite wisdom, grabbed two cups of Kool-Aid and dumped one on her skirt and one on mine. And then she said, look, now we match. <laughs> I'll never forget that. So you believe you shall be dear friends forever? I hope so. I don't know. The past few years I've noticed a change in her and I'm sure she's noticed lots of changes in me. All the diagnoses and meds and all that, but yeah, I've seen just how different we are at a fundamental level. She seems more superficial than I remember. Worried about what people think of her, which we never used to care about. She spends a lot of time on her hair and her makeup and her clothes and all that, which is fine, but I generally don't care too much about all that stuff. She's ditched me a few times now to hang out with different guys. Sometimes I wonder what she does with those guys. Is she sleeping with them? I don't know. It's none of my business, really. I wish we could talk about this kind of stuff. But lately, it's gotten harder and harder. Monica is sitting on the floor, very still. All love comes with its fair share of suffering. You know that all creatures that suffer pain suffered with Jesus. The firmament, the earth, failed for sorrow in their nature in their time of Christ's dying. How do you know? He showed me. The showing was vivid and lifelike, hideous and dreadful, sweet and lovely. And in all this, it was enormous comfort to me that our God and Lord, who is so holy and mighty, is also so homely and courteous. And this filled me full of happiness and certainty of the soul. Christ showed me a part of his passion near his dying. Veronica lays down on the ground on her back with her arms spread. As Julian speaks, blood pools around Veronica's body. I saw his sweet face as it were dry and bloodless with pale dying and later more pale, dead, languorine, and then turned more dead onto blue, and then more brown blue, and as the fresh, as the flesh turned more deeply dead. This was a pitiful change to see, this deep dying. The moisture clotted and dried, and the sweet body was brown and black, all turned out of life-like color onto dry dying. Drying bloodlessness, pain, hanging up in the air as men hang a cloth to try. Ah, hard and grievous was his pain, but much more hard and grievous it was when the moisture failed and began to dry, thus shriveling, slow with shrinking, drying, and with blowing of the wind from without, wind whistling through that dried body. And it pained him with cold more than my heart can think. Here, I truly felt that I loved Christ so much above myself that there was no pain that might be suffered like that sorrow that I had to see him in pain. 
Veronica sits up. Her face and arms are covered with rivulets of blood. Liz is too stunned to speak. He showed to us his passion as he bore it on this earth. Therefore, we are in distress and travail with him in our frailty during this life. For this little pain that we suffer here, we shall have an endless knowing in God, which we could never have without that. And the harder our pains have been with him in his cross, the more shall our worship be with him in his kingdom. So do not fear any times of trouble with Veronica. All shall be made well in heaven. Lights shift. Lights rise. The scene is now Liz and Veronica sitting in Liz's dimmed room. The girls are in their pajamas watching a movie. The light from the screen illuminates the girls' faces and flickers as the scenes change. The girls are still and engrossed in the movie and grab handfuls of popcorn without moving their eyes from the screen. We watch the girls watch the movie for about 30 seconds before the whispering starts. Liz is determined to ignore it. God, I wish people still dress like that. Are you kidding me? I don't think anyone has ever looked good in shoulder pads. It's not just the shoulder pads, it's the whole aesthetic. Plus, I already have the big hair. They paid tons for perms trying to get my hair. Veronica fluffs her hair absentmindedly. Liz looks around the room as if she is trying to figure out where the whispers are coming from. And I'm pretty sure I'd be killer at croquet. And the party they threw earlier looked just like the Drexel party I went to last month. Such a rager. Those guys were way hotter than the ones at Penn. You know, you kind of look like Winona Ryder. You have her cheekbones. And her eyes that just always look like they're three steps ahead of whoever she's talking to. Veronica shoves Liz playfully, but she is clearly pleased with this comparison. Oh, shush. The whispering grows louder, and Liz becomes more distracted from the movie. Julian comes into the room li- silently. Liz sees her, but pays her no mind. Veronica does not see her. Julian listens to the girls passively. I could do way better than Christian Slater. Connor's definitely cuter than he is here, don't you think? Liz doesn't answer. She is totally engrossed in the whispers. Connor was thinking of taking me out to White Dog Cafe downtown next weekend. Well, I made it pretty obvious that's what I wanted him to do, at least. Hey, Liz, are you even listening? Still no answer. Veronica turns off the movie and the whispers go silent. That seems to bring Liz back to reality. Why'd you do that? You were being really weird. I kept talking to you and you wouldn't answer me. Oh, gosh, that is really weird. Sorry. That's okay. Is everything okay? Yeah, mostly. I've had a lot of trouble sleeping lately. I'm basically falling asleep sitting up in class. I guess that's kind of what just happened. Damn, I'm sorry. That really sucks. Is insomnia a side effect of your new meds? Probably. It says pretty much every side effect you've ever heard listed at the end of an annoying commercial is a possibility. It's not even really insomnia. I just keep having these um, dreams. Julian cocks her head at this. She seems displeased but remains silent. Dreams of what? Promise you won't tell anyone about this? Promise. Pinky promise. The two girls interlock their pinkies for a moment in a pinky promise. Uh, They've been of Julian of Norwich. Remember the woman from the book I was reading? Of course I remember Rose. I keep seeing her. In my dreams, that is. She comes into my room and scares the crap out of me and then... What? She shows me all kinds of things. Things that she wrote about. Stuff she saw in her showings. And some of them are beautiful and wonderful and they leave me feeling amazing. So close to God. But some of them are really disturbing. Full of gore and blood and I just want it to stop. That's awful. You can't wake yourself up from them? I don't think I can. But I also don't want to. Why not? I don't want out of there as soon as possible. Because I feel like they're bringing me closer to God. I know it sounds dumb, but it's true. And the bad ones are just my cross to bear. I'll be better for them, even if it's hard. Whoa, that's kind of heavy. Yeah, it kind of is. 
So if I seem kind of out of it, that's why. I can't stop thinking about Julian. Well, as long as you've talked to your therapist about it. I haven't. Oh, your mom? No, it feels too personal. I'm scared they'll make me take different meds to make them go away. And I don't want to lose her. A moment passes as Veronica digests this information. Julian has heard enough. She glides out of the room. Okay. Well, I trust you. And I'm here for you. Thanks, Veronica. I trust you too. Veronica turns back on the movie. The two girls watch and the whispering begins again. Lights shift. Lights rise on the exterior of a movie theater. Veronica, Connor, and Liz exit the theater. They just saw a movie together. They stand under an awning. It's pouring rain. Oh my god, it's actually pouring. Do you want me to run and get the car? I'll pull it right up here so you guys don't get wet. Wow, I bet you'd feel like such a hero. Me and Liz are just damsels in distress. I should have known that was too chivalrous. As a modern woman, would you like to brave the storm and get the car for me and Liz? That sounds reasonable. I'll be right back. Veronica runs off stage into the rain. I'm so glad I finally got chance to. I'm so glad I finally got the chance to actually spend time with you, Liz. You know, it's crazy that we're in the same theology class, but we barely said two words to each other before today. But you know, I feel like we already kind of know each other, though. Veronica was telling me so much about you at the Phillies game that we went to last weekend. Really? What'd she say? Well, you know, how when you were kids, you told Veronica that you had magic powers and she believed you and told her mom how jealous she was that you had powers and she didn't. Liz laughs. Oh my gosh, that's so embarrassing. I forgot all about that. I told her I could control the bees that were outside the library. They would always come to me when I said so. And how did you manage to do that? I would only show off my power when I also happen to have candy in my pocket. Connor laughs. Oh, wow. And here I am thinking that a magician never reveals her secrets. Hey, I might not actually have the power to control the bees, but I might have powers you know nothing about. Well, I guess I'll just have to get you know you better then. I look forward to it. We see headlights and hear a car horn. There she is. Do you want my jacket? Um. Connor takes off his jean jacket and hands it to Liz, who holds it over her head as they both run into the rain to meet Veronica in the car. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz, writing at her desk in her bedroom with her back to the door. The whispering continues at a present but not distracting hum for most of the scene. Julian enters Liz's room. Hello, Elizabeth. Liz snaps around. Oh, gosh, you almost gave me a heart attack. Oh? (laughs) I guess I didn't hear you come in over the noise. Ah, yes. Those voices can get rather annoying. You could hear them, too? I thought I was the only one. Of course I can hear them, too. They're as real as I am. As real as what I saw in my illness. I wish I could really see what you saw. What has been your favorite showing of mine thus far? Oh gosh, that's hard. If I had to choose just one, I'd pick the hazelnut. Would you like me to show you what I saw? What God let me see? You can't just tell me? This is how God revealed it to me. So this is how I will reveal it to you. But I have to do so in a very particular way. May I sit at your desk and write? It'll be a great help. Okay. Liz gives up her seat at her desk for Julian. Liz sits on her bed cross-legged. While Julian leads Liz through the showing, she apparently writes everything she says down in Liz's notebook. Julian's body undergoes a physical change for the duration of her showing. Are you ready? I guess so. You are. Okay, Elizabeth. Close your eyes and ponder how intimately God loves you. God of thy goodness, give me thyself. Only in thee I have all. Liz sits up straighter and closes her eyes. Her hands are clasped together anxiously. I saw that he is everything that is good and supports us. 
He clothes us in his love, envelops us and embraces us. He wraps us round in his tender love and he will never abandon us. As I understand it, he is everything that is good. Do you see that, Liz? I think so. I don't know if I'm seeing it or if I'm just imagining it. No, it's quite real. Very far from your imagination. This is the realest thing there is. I want to believe you. I just feel kind of silly. Why don't you open your hands then? Liz opens her hands that have been clasped together and is shocked to see a hazelnut in the palm of her hand. Liz's body undergoes a physical change as she enters fully into this showing. It is apparent to the audience and to Liz and Julian. How did you? He also showed me a tiny thing in the palm of my hand, the size of a hazelnut. I looked at this with the eye of my soul and thought, what is this? And this is the answer that came to me. It is all that is made. What are you thinking, Elizabeth, about the hazelnut? I'm just shocked that it even exists. Like, it's so small and delicate. I thought it would disintegrate, but I'm sure it won't. And why is that? It lasts and ever shall because God loves it. Exactly. So every single thing owes its existence to the love of God. This tiny hazelnut has three properties. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loves it. And the third is that God preserves it. I just can't get over how small it is. We need to know how small all of creation is if we are to know God at all, because he's uncreated. This is why we are never at peace in heart and soul in this life. We seek rest in tiny things that cannot give us rest. And we do not realize that God is almighty for he is true rest. And God wants to be known. It pleases him when we rest in him for nothing else will satisfy us. It gives God such pleasure to see a vulnerable soul come to him, simply, openly, as a friend. Elizabeth, I want you to close your eyes and reach deep into your soul. Feel the Holy Spirit touch your soul. What does your soul say? Oh God of your goodness, give yourself to me. For you are enough for me, and if I want to be worthy of you, I cannot really ask for anything less. If I do ask for anything less, I shall remain in need. Only in you do I have everything. The whispering suddenly stops. A moment of silence. Liz slowly opens her eyes and takes in her surroundings like she has been gone. Julian's body returns to the way it was before. Liz's body is her own again. She still has the hazelnut in her hands. Is it over now? <laughs> is what over the showing i think that's up to you i think it's over the whispering stopped i feel so much better then my work here is done for now would you like to see more could i yes but there's only one thing in your way your medication what do you mean? How is my medication in the way? You want me to stop? Well, something to think about. I shall see you soon, Elizabeth. Until then, be well. Julian leaves the bedroom and enters her cell. Liz remains a moment, sitting, rolling the hazelnut around in her hands. She then sits down at the desk and flips through the pages of her notebook that Julian has written. Lights shift. Liz is writing in her notebook, and Julian is in her cell. There's a difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. That's what I've come to understand, at least. Connor comes on stage. He is Jesus in the showing Julian describes. Liz watches him, but does not react to him or his appearance. Julian is fixated on him. The scourging was thus. The psychologist is someone I go and talk to, like a therapist. She asks me how I'm doing, and I tell her what's been going on in my life. She remembers what I tell her, and even the names of my friends and family that I mention. If 
fair skin was broken full deep into the tender flesh with sharp smiting all about the sweet body. So plentifully the hot blood ran out, there was neither skin nor wound, but as it were all blood. And when it came where it should have fallen down, then it vanished. Blood begins to drip off of Connor's face and body. But today I saw a psychiatrist. From what I've seen, a psychiatrist is only concerned with prescribing medication, which I'm open to. I'm willing to try anything to feel better at this point. I'm talking to a dead woman after all. The bleeding continued a while till it might be seen and considered. And this was so plenteous to my sight that I thought it should have been made the bed all one blood and have spilled over. Connor moves between Julian and Liz, tracking blood across the floor into both women's spaces. But yeah, he just started grilling me as soon as I sat down. What are your symptoms? Any thoughts of self-harm? How about harm to others? Are you or have you ever been suicidal? I tried to answer the best I could, but I don't know. And after I saw with bloody sight in the face of the crucifix that hung before me on which I gazed continually, a part of his passion, despite spitting and sullying and buffeting and many lingering pains more than I can tell and often changing of color. I almost felt this pressure to make myself sound sick. Like I was afraid he would decide I wasn't sick enough for meds. But I guess I sounded sick enough because he handed me a prescription and said he wanted to see me in four weeks. The whole appointment took less than 20 minutes. Made me feel kind of weird. And one time I saw half the face, beginning at the ear, overgone with dry blood till it covered the mid face. And after that, the other half was covered in the same way while the first part vanished even as it came. But I'll try the meds for a while. And if they don't work, I'll try another. It's not really an exact science. He just made one thing very clear. I can't stop taking them cold turkey. I'll go through withdrawal. And things would really go south. Connor moves to Julian, and she addresses this last line to Connor. Then, with a glad cheer, our Lord looked onto his side and beheld rejoicing. He was sweet looking, and he showed a fair, delectable place and large enough for all mankind that shall be saved to rest in peace and in love. And he brought to mind his dear worthy blood and precious water, which he let pour out all for love. And with the sweet beholding, he showed his blessed heart, even cloven in two. And he said, lo, how I loved thee. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz alone in her room. She's laying on her bed, zoned out. She is listening to Joy by Bastille on a speaker. Liz is lethargic and hardly notices when Julian enters her room and stands by the door about as far away as she can be from Liz and still be in her room. Julian sounds far away. Hello, Elizabeth. Liz remains laying down in bed. You seem a little low energy today. You don't say. I sense you're being facetious. We usually call it sarcasm, but yeah. Duly noted. It's this new medication I'm on. It makes me feel... Nothing? That's a good way to describe it. It's so disorienting. I don't feel like myself at all. Then why are you taking this medicine? Because I have to. You have to? According to my doctors and my mom... Yeah. Liz finally sits up. Hey, why are you standing over there? You know you can sit down. I can hardly hear you. I am not able to come any closer. Why? Well, I think it has something to do with your medicine. Really? Does it weaken you or something? You could say that. I cannot come any closer. I cannot show you any of my showings. You are not yourself, and so I am not myself. Well, 
I don't like that. I like having you around. Reading your writing has been so good for me. And seeing the showing with the hazelnut has helped me grow spiritually. I finally feel close to God for the first time since my diagnosis. I wouldn't be me without you. I agree that my showings have helped you a great deal. But if you continue taking this medicine, I fear that I will have to leave you. But I have to keep taking my meds. I know the side effects suck, but it's helping me. I don't hear the voices so much. I feel more stable. I'm not constantly on guard. But you are not yourself. You are not well. I wasn't well before either. I know. And I want to help you. The only way I can do that is if you stop taking your medicine. So I can continue visiting you. So I can continue walking you through my showings. That is the only way to be well. You need to be fully yourself to be well. And you are not yourself right now, are you? You're right. I'm still not well. But to just go off my meds, I don't even know what would happen. Do you trust me? Of course I do. And I think you know what we must do. Liz hesitates only for a moment, nods and takes the three bottles of medication off of her desk. Julian simultaneously brings the waste paper basket from the corner of Liz's room to the center of the room. Liz kneels down in front of the waste paper basket and Julian stands over her. We're going to make you well and all shall be well, all shall be well. And all manner of things shall be well. Liz opens the first medicine bottle and dumps its contents into the waste paper basket, multicolored pills. Liz then opens the second bottle and empties its contents, many hazelnuts. Liz is confused and looks to Julian, who nods her on. Liz opens the final bottle, turns it over, and an impossible amount of blood pours from the bottle. Liz is horrified, blackout, then bleeding out by Imagine Dragons plays in the house. Lights fade. Act break.
Lights rise on the school hallway. Liz and Veronica are getting books from their lockers, checking their hair in a mirror, etc. Liz is noticeably more pale than before. She may look slightly wild-eyed, paranoid, tired, etc. I'm telling you, he was making eyes at me. You always think people are hitting on you. And I'm almost always right. I think the operative word here is almost. What was the conversation about? Well, that kind of takes the magic out of it, but he was telling us about the societal impacts of the Industrial Revolution. But to be fair, this was in the middle of class. And to also be fair, it is his job to lecture the class on American history. Exactly, but that doesn't change the fact that there was actual electricity between us. The undeniable electricity between Mr. Thompson and his 17-year-old U.S. history student. A classic love story. You do recall that you have a boyfriend, right? Oh, please. There's nothing wrong with some harmless flirting. Besides, I can't help when other people are interested in me. Connor understands what happens when you date a girl with my undeniable good looks and charm. Both girls laugh. Veronica accidentally drops a book on the ground. Liz picks it up for her and notices what it is. Oh, hey. I didn't realize you ever ended up reading any Julian of Norwich. Yeah, I didn't want to tell you that I finished so you didn't spoil the ending for me. Haha, <laughs> I'm sure you realize it isn't really the kind of book you can spoil like that. But oh my gosh, we have to talk about it. What did you think? I don't know if now is the best time to really- oh, come on. You can at least tell me if you like it or not. You know, I'm pretty into this stuff. The writing was really beautiful. I really got into that stuff about God being our mother as well as our father. I thought that was super cool and really empowering. I wish they talked about that stuff in our theology classes as if I actually care about the Pentateuch or whatever it's called. Okay, this book review is getting a little off track. The God, the Mother stuff is some of my favorite too. So you really liked it? Um, I don't know if I'd go that far. What do you mean? I think we should drop the subject. Why? You're acting super weird right now. Fine. If you really have to know, I can't get over the feeling that the whole thing is just really messed up. I mean, it's so ridiculously messed up that Julian prayed that God would make her sick. There's so many people in the world who are sick and would do anything to feel better, but Julian wants that for her own personal benefit. And I just can't get over this icky feeling that something is seriously wrong with her. Like, you'd actually have to be crazy to want to get sick. I don't care how holy you think it would make you. No, I don't think she's crazy. I just think she was a really troubled woman. And it's remarkable that she was able to turn her suffering into something that still resonates with people hundreds of years later, but that doesn't change that she was seriously mentally ill. And how can she believe in a loving God when this same God willingly caused her so much pain? What kind of God would do that? Do you kind of see where I'm coming from? I do, but... Look, we don't have to like the same things. This can just be your thing. I still think it's a really good book and there's some cool stuff in there, but... If you really want to know how I feel about it, it honestly reads like the writing is a mad woman. Just being honest here. Well, thanks for reading it, I guess. I have to go now. Liz rushes off to class before she starts crying. Bye, weirdo. Veronica closes her locker and struts off. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz, typing up a paper on her laptop for school. She's stressed and is very focused. Lots of voices are whispering. After a moment of this, Julian knocks on Liz's door lightly and waits in the doorway. Mom, I told you I have a lot of work to do tonight. Liz turns around, surprised to see Julian, not her mom, in the doorway. Oh, sorry. I thought you were my mom. Common mistake. Many people call me Mother Julian. You can too if you want. May I come in? I'm actually really busy today. Too busy for me? I just have this big research paper for my English class. Well, don't you deserve a break? Do I? I am sure you do. Plus, Elizabeth, I am just as important to your education as English class. Perhaps even more important. Why on earth would I believe that you're more important than school? Because this has to do with your soul. I am here for the education and formation of your soul. Fine. All I'm saying is that I also have a life outside of you. But should you? 
Liz doesn't have a response. Do you want to learn something new today? If I say yes, will you leave me alone? Yes, for now. Okay, fine. I want to show you something I think you'll find interesting. May I? Liz nods and gives her desk to Julian, who sits down and types on Liz's laptop. Liz sits on her bed, cross-legged. Over the course of the following showing, the whispering voices begin to get quieter and quieter, and Julian's and Liz's bodies go through a physical change. I'm ready. Close your eyes. It is a characteristic of God to overcome evil with good. Jesus Christ, therefore, who himself overcame evil with good, is our true mother. Are you following? Not really. Keep listening. We received our being from him, and this is where his maternity starts. And with it comes the gentle protection and guard of love, which will never cease to surround us. Just as God is our father, so God is also our mother. Just as God is our father, so God is also our mother. Our highest father, God Almighty, who is being, has always known us and loved us because of this knowledge through his marvelous and deep charity and with the unanimous consent of the Blessed Trinity, he wanted the second person to become our mother, our brother, our savior. Doesn't it then make sense that God being our father is also our mother? Well, I know you can't put a limit on God. He's supposed to be all things, so why wouldn't he also be our mother? Our father desires, our mother operates, and our good Lord, the Holy Ghost, confirms. Mother Julian? Yes? I am completely certain that I can see God creating us, you and me. I can see him loving us, and... And his love never lessens and never will. Very good. In this love, he accomplished all his works. And in this love, he oriented all things to our good. And in this love, our life is eternal. But creation was the start. The love which with he created us was in him from the very beginning. And in this love, in our beginning. In all this, we shall see it in God eternally. Liz opens her eyes slowly, and the voices have been silenced completely. The two women's bodies return to the way they were physically before the showing. How do you do that? Do what? Make the voices stop? And what is going on with our bodies? Ah, those are more complicated questions than you realize. Really? It is. And I don't know if I can answer in a way that you'll understand. Try me. Do you remember the first time I came to talk to you? We talked about making you well. That's what I'm doing. I'm helping you to become well, just like I was made well through my showings and my illness. I guess that kind of makes sense. I care about all of you, Elizabeth. Mind, body, and soul. When I reveal to you my showings, I'm making you well. The voices stop when I'm around, right? Yeah, they do. Your mind is forever changed by what you are seeing. And your body is also changed. All of you is being made well. You know, I was in a cell for over 30 years. I never touched another person in that whole time. No one was near to me in a physical sense. I was lonely, but I drew incredible comfort from ruminating on my showings. All the human contact the world has to offer, I offered up to God and I was rewarded with my showings. Maybe you should do the same. Distance yourself physically from those around you. Okay, I can try. Good. Good night, Elizabeth. Good night, Mother Julian. Julian exits the room. Liz crawls out of bed and goes to her desk. She looks at her essay, which is now finished. Liz is shocked. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz in her room. There's a soft knock on the door. Liz, honey, is it okay if I come in? Yeah, of course. (laughs) Why wouldn't it be? 
Amanda enters the room tentatively. I just haven't seen much of you today. You hardly left your room. I wanted to make sure you're doing okay with, you know. With what? Everything that's been going on. Oh, mental illness. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm doing okay. Good. I'm glad. So what have you been up to today? Not much. Slept late. Didn't really feel like doing much. I've mostly been reading. You didn't feel like doing much? Are you feeling more down than usual? I mean, yeah, definitely feeling down, tired, kind of empty, but also weirdly alert. You did seem pretty jumpy when I came in just now. Did something happen? No, nothing happened. What would even happen? I don't even know what you're talking about. Are you sure? That wasn't exactly convincing. Liz gets anxious from this line of questioning. She starts to visit, fidget with her necklace with the metal on it. Nothing happened, I swear. Is that a new necklace? A gift from a new boy I should know about? Liz realizes she messed up and drops the necklace down her shirt. What necklace? Yeah, that's not going to work. Let me see it. Liz reluctantly shows her mom the necklace without taking it off. A saint medal? She's not actually a saint, but she's a very holy woman. She's written a lot of cool stuff. I'm kind of a big fan. I'm getting to know her pretty well. Oh, it says something on the back. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Well, (laughs) isn't that nice? Really, that's a beautiful sentiment. And these are her dates, 1342 to 1416, question mark? Yeah, they don't know when she died. Oh. What? You were just talking about her as if she were alive, or that you knew her or something? Yeah, sorry. She's definitely been dead a while. Well, this medal is very pretty, and I'm glad you're finding significance in her writing. Where did you get the necklace? Liz doesn't say anything. Liz? That's kind of a hard question to answer. It is? It is. I don't see why it should be. Where did you get it? It was given to me. Like a gift? Kind of like a gift. Well, who gave it to you? Mom, please. Liz, this is important. Who gave you that medal? She did. What? She gave it to me, Mom. Who? Julian? I know how it sounds, but it's true. She gave me. Please, you're breaking my heart. But it's true. I don't know how it happened or why, but she gave it to me. No, you know that's not true. Please, Mom, you asked who gave it to me, and that's who. I'm being completely honest with you. Julian of Norwich gave it to me. Will you stop saying that? You sound crazy. You know I don't like that word. I don't like what I'm hearing, Liz. Can you explain to me how a medieval woman who has been dead for, what, 600 years could have possibly given you a medal or anything for that matter? I don't know, Mom. She begins to cry. I don't know what we're going to do with you. I don't know either. I really thought the counseling would help. And if not the counseling, the medication for sure. I guess not. I must have done something wrong. I must be a terrible mother. I don't know what I expected after what happened to your dad. Maybe the mistake was with your school. If this is what happens when you put your kids in Catholic education, I'm going to call your therapist and your psychiatrist and see what they have to say. Because I clearly have no idea how to help you. Amanda leaves. Liz is alone. She continues to cry. Julian enters silently and puts a comforting hand on Liz's shoulder. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz's Catholic high school hallway. She crouches to put her books in her locker. Connor comes up behind her and taps her on the shoulder. She whips around breathlessly. Hey, Connor. Hey, did you uh, did you do the Theo reading? Yeah, most of it. It was such a slog, though. I didn't do it. 
As usual. <laughs> well, can you blame me? Aqueous is nobody's favorite. Can't argue with that one. So, um, I had a question for you. You already asked me a question about the theology reading, remember? You were too sharp, but, um, had a real question though about, about real life. Okay, shoot. What are you doing after school? Um, well, I normally walk home with Veronica, but she canceled on me. She has to retake a math quiz or something. I know. <laughs> okay, genius. Why'd you ask if you already knew the answer? Well, because I was hoping you'd want to go to the library with me and, um, maybe do the Theo reading. Oh, yeah, I can do that. And if you want, we could go out to dinner afterwards? And that's okay with Veronica? What do you mean? I just wanted to make sure she was okay with us hanging out and that she wasn't expecting you to wait for her or anything. Um, well, actually, I haven't told her about this, but uh, I don't think she really gets a say in this case. Why? Um, well, Veronica isn't retaking a math quiz after school. She has plans to hang out with Shannon Black and go to the mall. Really? Why would she lie to me? I don't know, Liz. Well, then, if she's going to keep where she is from me, I won't tell her what I'm up to. I'll see you at the library at 3.30. Great. I can't wait. Connor flashes Liz a smile and walks confidently away. Liz is upset but sets her brow and heads to her next class. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz's bedroom where Liz is sitting at her desk. She's writing in her planner. Whispering starts as Julian comes into the room. Hello, Elizabeth. Fancy seeing you here. How was your date with Connor? First of all, how did you know about that? Second of all, it wasn't a date. I was just helping him with the theology reading. I see. And your plans to see him again tomorrow? Is that also not a date? I don't owe you an explanation. He's dating Veronica. I'd never go after her boyfriend, so that's the end of that. Did you come here just to break me, or- I came here to warn you. Guard your heart. You're getting yourself into a pretty complicated situation. I told you it would be beneficial to keep your distance from other people. You haven't told Veronica about hanging out with Connor? I haven't, and I won't. She's been keeping stuff from me, so I get to keep stuff from her. I was already keeping you from her, so... <laughs> I almost forgot. She still thinks you just dream of me. So you're judging me now? For doing something wrong? What happened to the person who wrote this? Liz flips open her copy of Julian's Revelations to a marked passage and reads... Therefore, I must grant that everything that is done is done well, for it is God that does all, for he is the point of the center. There is no doer but he, and I was sure he did no sin. And here I saw truly that sin has no substance, for in all there was never a sight of sin. And so the rightfulness of God's work was shown to my soul. So, sin is behovely, or whatever that word is. Sin is nothing. So, I'm doing nothing. When I said sin is nothing, it was not an invitation to abandon all morality. I have a showing to share with you today. I don't think I want it. I'm not sure how I feel about you. If you're just going to judge everything I say or do, then I don't no. know if I You told me you want to be well, and I am going to do what it takes to make that happen. This is for your own good. Liz says nothing and looks distrustful, but she sits on the bed and waits for the showing to start. Liz's and Julian's bodies change in the most dramatic way they have so far during this showing. Blood flows from Liz's body throughout the showing. Okay, Elizabeth. Ruminate on the words of Christ. I thirst. The blessed body hung alone there and dried for a long time, and the nails wrenched it as the weight of the body pulled against them. Do you understand? No. Try. I understand that because of the softness of the tender hands and feet, 
The huge, hard, hurtful nails pull the wounds wide open. The body sags with the weight of its long hanging. Why are you showing this to me? And there was piercing and wrenching of the head and the binding of the crown of thorns, all caked with dried blood with the sweet hair twined in it. Dried flesh sticking to the thorns and thorns to the dying flesh. Do you see? I see the blood is bleeding and the thorns make the wounds gape wide. I see too the sweet skin and tender flesh with its hair and blood all raised and loose above the bone because of the thorns. I don't like this. I want it to stop. You want to be holy, don't you? This is what I saw in order to be holy. The thorns had stabbed the skin into pieces so that it sagged like a cloth. I did not see how the wounds were made, but I understood it was by the sharp thorns and by the way the crown was crammed on, roughly and harshly, hard and without pity. Now, what do you see? The flesh, <laughs> it's, it's drying out. It's losing weight and setting around the crown of thorns like a circle, like one crown upon another. I don't want to see this. I don't want to. She squeezes her eyes shut, balls up her fists to her eyes, and shakes her head vigorously. Julian watches calmly and goes on as before, despite Liz's protests. During the next line, Liz becomes more and more upset until she's having a full breakdown. The crown of thorns was stained with blood, and the other crown and the head were the same color, the color of dried blood. The skin of the flesh that sagged from the face and body was full of small wrinkles and was a tanned color, like dry scorched board and the face was browner than the body the room seems to spin around liz liz is totally overwhelmed as julian plows on stained with blood the color of dried blood flesh sagging sagging away from the face sagging away from the body wrinkled skin a dry scorched board tan skin brown face with blood brown sagging face with blood be well the room slows its spinning but continues to turn both julian's and liz's bodies return to how they were before the showing the blood is gone but liz's body is exhausted this is what you need to see to become to be holy don't worry elizabeth all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all shall be well. Julian exits Liz's room calmly and serenely. Right after she exits, Liz's mom enters the room in alarm and runs to her daughter who is inconsolable. Lights shift. Lights rise. A confessional. A priest is sitting on one side of the screen with his head bowed, hands folded and eyes closed. Liz enters the confessional, holding her journal, and kneels on the other side of the screen. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been seven months since my last confession. A pause while Liz gathers her thoughts. She takes a deep breath and opens her journal. I have lied to my mom. I've been really jealous of my best friend. I've lied to her. I've cursed. I've masturbated. And... A good moment passes before Liz can finish her thought. I kissed my best friend's boyfriend, so that's what's been on my heart. The priest only nods his head for 30 seconds or so. His eyes are still closed and his hands are folded. When he is done thinking, he opens his eyes. First, let us thank the Lord for the grace of a good confession. I commend you for your honesty and your willingness to seek out God's mercy. Liz keeps her head bowed and plays with her hands anxiously. As for your cursing, you really need to break that habit. It's really unbecoming of a young lady to curse. It's very unattractive. Liz's head snaps up in shock, but she remains silent. This boyfriend of your friend... Have you known him long? Kind of. How long have you known him? I've known him for a few years now, but we were never close until this year. Well, you know what you have to do. You have to end your involvement with this boy. 
I see. You care very much about your friend. I do. Then you have to do what's right for her sake. End the relationship with the boy. Your act of contrition. Dear God, I am sorry for my sins with all my heart. In choosing to do wrong and failing to do good, I have sinned against you, Lord, whom I should love above all things. I firmly intend, with your help, to do penance, to sin no more, and to avoid whatever leads me to sin. For your penance, say three Hail Marys and ask God to make your soul well. We hear a voice whispering intrusively. The priest evidently does not hear it, but it bothers Liz. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that last part. What did you say? The whispering continues. We can start to make out what it is saying. Some combination of the words well, be well, all shall be well, over and over. I said, you should ask God to make your soul well. No response from Liz as she starts to get freaked out by the voices. That is part of your penance. Uh, got it. Can I go now? Surely you must want absolution. The whispers are quite loud now, though we can still clearly hear Liz and the priest's words. Liz is very anxious to leave. Uh, yeah, I'm ready now. The priest extends his hand, palm facing Liz, in blessing. During this next line, the whispers get even louder and crescendo to the point where the priest has to shout over them to be heard. God, the Father of mercies, through the heaven, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Liz moves to the door as quickly as she can as soon as the priest finishes his blessing. Amen. Thank you, Father. She exits the confessional. As soon as the door closes with a slam, the voices stop. We see the priest with his head bowed, hands folded, and eyes closed, just as he was before Liz entered. He seems unbothered. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz and Connor, sitting on the floor of Liz's bedroom. Liz is reading her well-loved copy of Julian's Revelations. Connor's pretending to read a book, maybe Hildegard of Bing and Scivius, maybe Teresa of Avila's The Interior Castle. Notebooks, handouts, and textbooks are scattered on the floor. Every so often, Liz tries to steal a glance at Connor. Incomprehensible whispering fills the room. Evidently, it bothers Liz, but Connor, of course, cannot hear it. Did you say something? Nope. Oh, sorry. I have trouble hearing sometimes. Can you, uh, can you remind me what this presentation is supposed to be on again? <laughs> oh my gosh, do you ever listen? We're supposed to make a presentation about different theologians' opinions on the purpose of sufferings in our lives. And you've, you've been reading something that relates to that, this Julian person? Mm hmm How about this passage for our presentation? For bliss is lasting and pain is passing and shall come to nothing for those who shall be saved. And therefore, it is not God's will that we should linger over pain with sorrow and sadness, but that we should pass quickly through it to joy without end. What does that even mean? Just that pain happens in everyone's lives, but we shouldn't get hung up on it because something better is waiting for us. And that something better is... Heaven? Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, you know, that that's why you're in charge of this whole Theo project. You know all the stuff about this Julian dude. Well, she's a girl, but thank you. Liz begins looping a strand of hair into a knot. Why do you do that? Do what? This. Connor reaches over to Liz's hair and attempts to tie her hair in a knot like she did, but just makes it messy. Liz giggles. <laughs> Well, I was trying to get the hair out of my face, but then I remembered how much I hate the way my ears look. What's wrong with your ears? I've just always hated them. They're so ugly. They stick out so far from my head. When I was a kid, I always got teased by the other kids about them. 
<laughs> well, that's just silly because you have really cute ears. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> very funny. No, I mean it. You have really cute ears. Liz starts to blush. Connor reaches over and gently tucks Liz's hair behind her ear. They lock eyes, but then both realize what they're doing and move apart quickly. <laughs> Did I tell you about the silly thing my mom said to me this morning? Uh, no, I don't think so. So, I told my mom you were coming over to work on this theology project. And she was like, so what exactly is he coming over to do? And I'm like, I just told you we're partners with this presentation. Then she asked where we'd work, and I said, I was just thinking we could be in my room, and she freaking raised her eyebrows at me. Oh my god, that is a strange omen. I know, right? I was like, Mom, get real. Connor's dating my best friend. It's not like anything is going to happen between us. Connor looks crestfallen for a moment before catching himself and returning to normal. Liz notices. What? Nothing. Didn't look like nothing. No, really. You know. Um. So, uh, you said your mom raised her eyebrows. Did she say anything else? She just reminded me of this rule she has. And what rule is that? A rule where I can't close the door if you're in here. Connor snorts. <laughs> and is that a rule that applies to just me, or? <laughs> no, it applies to all guys. Well, I see. Well, I guess that makes me feel a little bit better. Both of them are staring at the wide open door to Liz's bedroom. But I could close the door. Liz's whispering voices grow louder and start to sound like Julian's voice multiplied and overlapped many times. It echoes every time it speaks. You look pale. Are you okay? Not. I'm fine. I just thought I heard my mom. Aw, is somebody a little bit paranoid? Liz can't help but smile, but rolls her eyes and playfully shoves Connor. Oh, shush. A moment passes between the two in silence. They look back to their reading. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. Hey, uh, you want to do a favor for me? Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. What's the favor? Want to close the door for me? I don't know. Come on. I promise it'll be okay. Are you scared? You're a coward. Close the door. Liz has heard enough. She gets up to close the door. As she walks to the door, we hear the whispering again and it gets louder. What would mom think? What would Veronica think? What would mom think? What would Veronica think? Liz closes the door decisively and the whispers suddenly stop. She sits down cross-legged in front of Connor. Better? Much. Yeah. Don't you know I've been trying to get us alone now, together, for a while? And you succeeded. You made sure we were partners for this assignment, and the classic way to get someone alone is to get them paired up for a theology project. Connor shrugs smugly. Liz notices a marking on his hand. What's that? Oh, um, you know, it's just, just a reminder so I don't forget to do my, my calc homework. He trails off. Liz isn't listening. She puts her hand against Connor's hand with their palms together. As they touch, the whispering continues. Your hands are so cold. Your hands are so small. Maybe your hands are just big. Um, Liz, kiss Connor. Kiss him now. Do you think he wants to kiss you? You know you want to kiss him. Liz pulls her hand away from Connor suddenly. Connor's confused, but not hurt. He returns to a book. Veronica, best friend, kiss. Connor, Veronica, best friend, kiss. Connor. So, um, how are things going with Veronica? Connor looks at Liz, confused. Um, it's going pretty well, I'd say. That's good. She was telling me about your date last weekend. Oh yeah? And what did she say? Let's see. She said you spent like the entire weekend together. Yeah, that sounds like Veronica. Yeah, then she said you went apple picking, you took her out to dinner, you surprised her with a bouquet of daisies, which are her favorite, and then you both 
got super drunk by the lake and made out in the car. <laughs> yeah, wow, that um, that pretty much sums it up. So you'd say it's going well? Yeah, I guess so. That wasn't very convincing, especially since Veronica told me you two are basically in love. Connor gets quiet. Liz cringes as the whispering gets louder. Liz? Yeah? Do you, do you feel like you have voices in your head? I actually do. Voices that tell you what to do? And like, you know they're not real, but I feel like maybe you should listen to them? Kiss him. Kiss him. Kiss him. Liz nods. Like, I know it's really wrong or whatever, but... I like you a lot, and I feel like I should kiss you. That's what I'm hearing, too. Kiss him. kiss him now! Kiss him now! Kiss him now! Connor leans closer to Liz. Uh, but what about Veronica? Don't worry about her. It only gets easier from here. Kiss him now! Yes. Liz kisses Connor. The whispering is deafening. When she pulls away, it is silent. Liz and Connor smile and lean against the wall. Connor puts his arm around Liz. Now, isn't that so much better? <laughs> Everyone always talks about how romantic the second kiss is. What? Are you telling me I wasn't as good as the first time? <sighs> oh, shush. <laughs> well, I just have to say, you know, I knew I was right about you. What do you mean? Well, you know, I just, I've heard what Veronica says about you, and I guess I... Veronica yeah. talks to you about me? What does she say? Oh, nothing. You know, just that, just that you're more sensitive than most people. So. What does that even mean? Well, I mean, you know how Veronica is. She says things she doesn't mean, okay? She's like, I love Liz. She's my best friend. You know, she's crazy, but whatever. Did you use that word? Crazy? Well, yeah, yeah, I remember using it a couple times, okay? Liz turns red. I don't understand. How could you think I'm crazy? You said you hear the voices, too. Well, I, I don't know. Not not actually. Do, do you actually hear voices? I do. I have schizophrenia, and among other things, that means I hear things sometimes that aren't really there. Oh, and... And you thought I hear things too. Well, I, I was just talking about like my conscience and just stuff. Just forget it, okay? This is clearly a mistake. No, no, look, you know, it's cool. Like, you know, I don't, I don't care if you're a schizo or whatever. And what? Well, you're a schizo, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Like we can still hang out and stuff. All right, you're all right. Cause you know, all this stuff's like in your head. So it doesn't matter. A schizo? What? You realize you're being incredibly offensive right now. Okay, calm down, all right? It's just a joke. You should go. Well, come on, look, Liz. Get I don't... out. Well, what about the project? Just get out. Connor scowls at Liz, but leaves without another word after collecting his books. Liz starts to cry angrily, still sitting on her bedroom floor. The incomprehensible whispering begins again and starts to grow louder. After a minute, Liz wipes her eyes and starts repeating the same phrase to herself over and over. Bliss is lasting and pain is passing. Bliss is lasting and pain is passing. Bliss is lasting and pain is passing. Bliss is lasting. Lights shift. Lights rise on an empty space, much like the opening sequence. What follows is a pantomime. We see the characters of Liz, Veronica, Mom, Connor, Julian, and the priest move into and out of the space freely while instrumental music plays. An appropriate song would be imagined by Drez. The characters may dance, but it is not required. What is required is that we see the characters interact. Connor telling Veronica about his involvement with Liz and their reactions, Mom helping Liz take her medication, and Liz only pretending to take the pills. Liz going to confession with the priest. Julian is present at all times. The whole sequence should last about three minutes. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz's family room, where mom and Veronica sit. 
Veronica is nervous. It is unclear what her intentions and motivations are as she speaks. You sure you don't want anything to drink? I'm all right. Thanks, Mrs. Price. Well, I appreciate you reaching out to me. Said you had something you wanted to tell me about Liz? Yeah, uh, I'm worried about Liz. But of course, I'd never tell her that, even though we're best friends, even though I care about her so much. I thought I understood what was going on. I mean, who doesn't get super freaked out during senior year? It's enough to make anyone crazy. She realizes she shouldn't have said that word. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's a, a lot, you know? It makes everyone anxious. And then you add a schizophrenia diagnosis on top of that. But that's something that can be treated. She was getting help for it. Talking to therapists and psychiatrists. But then she started telling me about how she couldn't sleep at night and how her sleep is disturbed by the dreams she would have of that woman, Julian. I think she knows what she's seeing isn't real, but she talks about her as if she's real, like really alive. I've heard about Julian too, but Liz calls these things dreams. They're not hallucinations. She's only told me they're dreams, but she often seems distracted like she's in another world. And I saw once that during history class, she wasn't taking notes at all. She just wrote the word showings really big at the top of the page and then wrote all shall be well like a thousand times filling up the page. I asked her once about the dreams. I wanted to know what Julian would say to her, but this is what really concerns me. She wouldn't answer. She seems really freaked out. So yeah. I'm worried about her because I don't think this is normal anymore, even for Liz. The problem is obviously that she doesn't even seem to think anything is wrong. In fact, she said these dreams have been good for her, like spiritually. She said they bring her closer to God. That's the freakiest part to me. You're right. That is very concerning. Do you know if Liz stopped taking her medication? I have no idea if she's off her meds, but what's the point? If she thinks she's better for having these dreams or showings or whatever you want to call them, then are we really doing her a service trying to stop them from happening? If they really make her happy or better in some way, should we want to take that away from her? I just don't know. I've been asking myself the same question, but she's ill and we need to help her. I'm just not sure how. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz in her room. She is listening to music, turned the radio on by Keen, and is trying to write in a notebook but is distracted and keeps crossing out what she has written. She is fidgety and keeps looking around the room. She jumps a little at a knock on her door. Yeah? Amanda comes into Liz's room, slightly apprehensive but trying to hide it. She sits on Liz's bed. Hey, honey. Do you have a moment? I mean, I was kind of in the middle of my calc homework, but it's whatever. I just wanted to talk to you about how you're doing. Just like generally? Yeah. How school is, how your mood has been, any new symptoms or side effects from your medication, anything you wanted to tell me. Why do I feel like I'm going to get in trouble or something? Not. I just wanted to know how you were doing. Because I got a phone call a few days ago. From? Mr. Quincy, your English teacher. That's weird. What did he say? Well, that's particularly what I wanted to talk to you about. He said you turned in an essay recently. Do you remember what it was about? Yeah, it was a British literature paper. We could kind of choose our own topics. I decided to write on Julian. Right. Julian of Norwich. I remember you telling me you liked her writing, but... Mr. Quincy called me because he read your essay. I'm guessing you haven't gotten your grade on it yet. We haven't gotten them back yet. Well, what did Mr. Quincy say? Liz, Mr. Quincy called because he read your essay and he said it was gibberish. What? He said he couldn't read it. It was total gibberish interspersed with direct quotes from that book, her book. The showings. Liz, what is going on? 
<laughs> Nothing, mom. I just wasn't feeling well when I wrote that essay, I guess. See, I might buy that if there wasn't anything else going on, but I already asked you about that necklace you haven't taken off in weeks. And don't think I haven't noticed all the hazelnuts that are all around the house. I'm asking for your own good. I want to help you. Please, Liz, what is going on with you? Liz doesn't answer. Amanda shakes her head and looks around the room. Have you been taking your meds today? Where are your meds? Liz, where are your meds? I had to get rid of them. What? They were making me worse, so I got rid of them. You're off your meds. Liz, you need your medication. You could go through withdrawal. You could have gotten really hurt. Now everything Veronica said makes sense. You talked to Veronica? About what? She came to me because she was worried about you. She told me about the dreams you've been having and about how this Julian woman has been talking to you and how you think your illness is bringing you closer to God. <laughs> I can't believe she would betray me like that. I trusted her. You wouldn't have told me if it wasn't a seriously concerning problem. This is about your safety. And going off your meds is a serious problem, Liz. No more lying. No more games. Please tell me what's been going on. Fine. I started hearing whispers, which isn't out of the ordinary for someone with schizophrenia. But then I started seeing Julian of Norwich, not in a dream. Oh, when I'm in this room, usually when I'm writing, she comes to see me. At first, I was like, of course, this is just a hallucination. What else could it be? But then she started to give me things. Hazelnuts, this necklace. And she would show me all that she went through in her life. Her sickness brought her closer to God and made her a very holy woman. She showed me all kinds of beautiful and holy things. She made some good points about how my medication was making me less like myself. And she couldn't come see me anymore if I kept taking my meds. So I got rid of them. And now I just feel awful and sick and- Liz <laughs> sobs. Amanda puts her arms around Liz and holds her while she cries. A minute goes by like this. <laughs> Liz, honey, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were hurting like this. I feel like I failed you. No, mom, you haven't. Things just got out of control so quickly. I didn't want to do any harm. I didn't even want to believe Julian at first. I just couldn't explain how all this stuff happened. Well, I think I can at least help with some of that. Veronica told me that she had that necklace in her backpack for months before you started wearing it. <sighs> Found it in the girl's locker room at school, and it must have fallen out of her backpack when she was here. But Julian gave it to me. I just thought... Um, what about the hazelnuts? I keep finding them everywhere. <laughs> There are hazelnut trees lining almost every street in town. They're always all over the ground. You've been bringing them home with you. So none of it was real. It was all for nothing. <laughs> Julian wasn't helping me. I'm just crazy and that's all. Because you're not crazy. We just need to get you the help you need. It'll all be okay. <laughs> Liz and her mom continue to cry and hold each other. Lights shift. Julian comes onto stage alone. She seems weak. When the soul continually seeks God, it pleases him greatly. For the soul can do no more than seek, suffer, and trust. Seek, suffer, and trust. This is what I did all my life. Seek out Jesus in my own little world, my cell. Suffer through illness and loneliness and doubts and trust in God that he will always provide for me. That is what I wanted to give Liz. 
a life where she can seek, suffer, and trust. Did I help her? Only Jesus can be her refuge and help, even in the suffering, even in the pain, even when we cannot see him or feel him, for he wills that we believe we can see him all the time continually, even though it seems to us we see him very little. When we believe this, he helps us all the time to get grace, for his will is to be seen and to be sought. His will is to be waited for and trusted. Seek, suffer, and trust. Julian exits. Lights shift. Lights rise on Liz crouching to get books from her locker in the high school hallway. Veronica enters and walks over to Liz. Hey, Liz. I don't want to talk to you, Veronica. Fine, don't talk, just listen. Let me say this one thing and then I'll leave you alone. Liz says nothing but turns to face Veronica. I just wanted to say, I need you to know that I'm sorry. I'm sorry I told your mom the stuff you told me in confidence, but you have to understand I was mad, so mad. I can't believe you told my mom. How could you do that to me? Well, you kissed my boyfriend. How did you know that? He told me, of course. He told me right before he dumped me. Oh. Yeah, uh, he told me kissing you made him realize that there weren't any fireworks between us anymore. So basically he's a total ass. Veronica, I'm really sorry I kissed Connor. I don't know what I was thinking. I got it. I just heard from Shannon Black, this is your last day, so I needed to talk to you before. Well, I appreciate it. And for the record, I do forgive you. I don't really want to, but I forgive you. A moment passes between them. Hey, do you remember when you asked me what I would do if I had one day on Earth? Yeah. You said you wanted to play fairies, right? Right, but... I need you to know the important part of that is that I want to spend the day, my last day on earth with you, even now. Thanks, Veronica. So, will I see you soon? I don't think so, but it's okay. Until then, God is going to take care of us, okay? Okay. Bye, Liz. Bye, Veronica. Veronica exits. Liz leans against the locker for a moment, then addresses the audience. Julian of Norwich was a real person. She was an anchoress and a writer. She was a mystic and an incredibly holy woman. But Julian of Norwich is not a saint. Why is that? Julian walks on stage, almost gliding, and takes Liz by the hand, and the two glide together as Liz continues talking. The scene behind them transforms from the school hallway to a sterile blank space. One reason is that we don't know much of anything about her life. Another is that we don't know where she's buried. Julian then helps Liz put on a hospital gown over her school uniform. The setting is now an inpatient treatment facility. But the biggest reason is that there are no miracles attributed to her. But I don't really agree with that. I can think of two. The first is the fact that Julian's writing survived all these years. What are the odds that any writing would reach us hundreds of years after it was written? And the odds that writing would come from a woman enclosed in a cell in the English countryside are nearly insurmountable, except by the grace of God. Julian helps Liz onto a hospital bed, sitting with her legs crisscross. Julian glides off stage. The second miracle is that Julian brought me here, an, in an inpatient treatment facility for schizophrenia. Even though she hasn't been on this earth for centuries, Julian's spirit came to me personally and made sure I'm getting the help I need. 
I don't think I would be here if it weren't for her. And she really did bring me closer to God. There is no way I could endure all that I had without his overwhelming, incomprehensible love. Liz reaches for her journal and pen on the bedside table. She opens the journal. A lot of people hear my story and feel sorry for me. I'm so sick that I have to put my entire life on hold, college, my childhood, freedom, to try to get well. But I know that God works in ways that I don't understand. And if he can work through Julian's illness, he can certainly work through mine. And in the meantime, I'll be writing. And all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Right? Lights fade as Liz writes. End of play. At this time, I'd like my wonderful cast to come on screen. I would like to thank them for their hard work and dedication to this project. Our cast is Callista Kinnan as Liz, Jacqueline Janowski as Julian, Vanessa Fitzpatrick as Amanda, Lisa Von Werder as Veronica, Rees Bailey as Connor, George Copeland as the priest, and Lindsay Goldschmidt reading stage directions. I would like to give another special thanks to my director, Isabel Grogan, and to the Platform Production Company for their assistance with this presentation. Thank you all again, and thank you for watching. <laughs>